Good evening. Welcome to the 2024 AWP Conference and Book Fair in Kansas City. My name is January Gill O'Neill, and I am chair of AWP's Board of Directors for Accessibility. I'd like to offer a visual description of myself. I'm a black woman wearing a very gold sweater. <laughs> AWP, thank you. <laughs> AWP is a small but mighty nonprofit organization that amplifies the voices of writers and academic programs and organizations that serve them, all while championing diversity and excellence in creative writing. I am a member of AWP's Board of Directors, but first and foremost, I am a member. Membership with AWP provides me with writing opportunities year-round, but just as important, it allows me to support other writers, especially those who are just starting out. I'm just curious, how many of you are first-timers? Can you raise your hands? Okay, everybody look around. First-timers. That's awesome. My membership dues help writers find meaningful careers and publication opportunities and make service, services like Writer to Writer Mentorship Program possible. If you aren't already, I invite you to become a member today. We would like to begin this evening's event by acknowledging the original peoples and the land on which this conference is being held. This event and other featured events is being live streamed to those around the country and the world. We ask for those viewing this event tonight to reflect on the original peoples of lands on which you reside and acknowledge all traditional territories of indigenous peoples. <laughs> yes. We welcome our honored guests from all indigenous communities attending this conference. We would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Indigenous Aboriginal American Writers Caucus and Shauna Osborne for guidance, advocacy, and for all the support they've given us to recognize all Indigenous communities' participation in AWP and beyond. Now we want to welcome Elise Passion. Elise Passion, an enrolled member of the Osage Nation, is the author of six poetry collections most recently, Tall Chief, and her forthcoming book, Blood Wolf Moon. Her poems have appeared in publications such as Poetry Magazine, The New Yorker, a Norton Anthology of Native Nations Poetry, and The Best American Poetry. She has edited or co-edited numerous anthologies, including The Eloquent Poem and the New York Times bestseller, Poetry Speaks. Passion teaches in the MFA program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Please welcome Elise Passion. Thank you, Jan. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional ancestral lands of many tribal nations, including the Kickapoo, Ka, Oto Missouri, Lakota, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Sioux, and Osage. I am of the Osage Tribal Nation. Our ancestral territory spread throughout the Midwest and the Great Plains and our primary homelands included Arkansas and Missouri from A.D. 500 to 1825. Then we were forced to move. The process of knowing and acknowledging the land we stand on is a way of honoring and expressing gratitude for the peoples who were here and are still here on these ancestral lands. This is a momentous time for the Osage Nation. The United States Mint recently issued a quarter featuring my mother 
the prima ballerina Maria Tallchief in her iconic Firebird Leap with her name Wakse Thunba, woman of two worlds represented in Osage orthography. Our Osage composer, Scott George, is nominated for a 2024 Academy Award for his song, Wajaje, a song for my people, performed by Osage tribal singers. <clears throat> the world now is learning about a tragic period of American history, the Osage Reign of Terror documented in David Grant's book and Martin Scorsese's movie. A line from my poem, Wigia, helped to inspire the title of both the book and the film, Killers of the Flower Moon. <clears throat> I will read that poem and two more. Wigia, which means prayer in Osage, is spoken by Molly Burkhart, whose sister, Anna Kyle Brown, was murdered during the Reign of Terror. My Talchi family lived on the Osage Reservation during this time period, 1921 to 1926. The epigraph reads, Anna Kyle Brown, Osage, 1896-1921, Fairfax, Oklahoma. Wigia. Because she died where the ravine falls into water. Because they dragged her down to the creek. In death, she wore her blue broadcloth skirt. Though frost blanketed the grass, she cooled her feet in the spring. Because I turned the log with my foot, her slippers floated downstream into the dam, because after the thaw, the hunters discovered her body. Because she lived without our mother, because she had inherited head rights for oil beneath the land. She was carrying his offspring. The sheriff disguised her death as whiskey poisoning, because when he carved her body up, he saw the bullet hole in her skull. Because when she was murdered, the leg clutchers bloomed, but then froze under the weight of frost. During Zaga Ziga Setha, the killer of the flower's moon. I will wade across the river of the blackfish, the otter, the beaver. I will climb the bank where the willow never dies. This next one is from my poem, Heritage. Heritage 10. The year my mother was born in Fairfax, Oklahoma, white men were marrying Osage women and killing them for their head rights. My mother was born a year after the Indian Citizenship Act was passed Indians tied to the U.S. for or against their wills. Three years before her birth, her half-sister, baby Ruth's grave, was dynamited with nitroglycerin by outlaws scavenging for diamonds and gold buried inside the casket. In the tall chief plot, I wander through family history, the marble monuments, angelic statues, measuring each step on grass, memorizing photographs. This one of a striking beauty, my great grandmother, Eliza Big Heart Tallchief, surviving her husband by 50 years. The widow, the adored grandmother of my mother, Eliza. Only now do I see my name, a permutation of hers. At home in Chicago, every day I pass family photographs framed on walls, my great-grandfather's oval sepia portrait of his boyish face replicated on the headstone. 
instead of the young bride, here is Eliza, a tribal elder, wrapped in a multicolored blanket, standing outside her front porch, a photo taken after all those years she outlived him. And I will conclude with a short poem inspired by Carolyn Quintero's Osage Dictionary, with thanks to Christopher Cote of the Osage Nation Language Department for providing the column in orthography. I'll read the poem in English. Typewriter. I zigzag into the world, a woman, a wolf, within my heart, an untamed horse, what do you call it? The wind. Which pathway to that star or the orbit of a star? Vapor rises off standing water. Upstairs tell untruths, that of a tongue. Time is just the ticking noise against metal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elise. We would now like to thank our sponsors for making this conference possible. We are grateful to Andrews McMeal Publishing, our major sponsor, and the National Endowment of the Arts. We thank you so much for your continued support. I'd also like to thank the community here in Kansas City. As many of you know, Missouri State Legislature in the past few years have proposed bills that would threaten the livelihood and basic health care needs of transgendered people, as well as necessary gender affirming care. The legislation is deeply troubling and antithetical to AWP's inclusive mission of supporting writers and members from various backgrounds and life experiences. It has been our goal since the beginning to work to support LGBTQIA plus writer communities here in Kansas City. Over the past year, the AWP staff and board have had the opportunity to spend some time with community members and local officials who have helped and supported us in our mission. One such person is Senator Greg Razor. Senator Razor, a Democrat, is the state senator for the seventh senatorial district serving part of Jackson County. He was first elected to serve in the Senate in 2020, making him the only making him only the second ever openly LGBT plus member of the Missouri Senate. Senator Razor's advocacy on LGBT plus rights has been featured on NBC's Dateline, Politico, The New York Times, and more. Senator Razor's work has also been cited as having helped to convince Netflix's Queer Eye seasons three and four to film in Kansas City. Senator Razor has advocated for many other various groups while in the Senate. As various pieces of legislation he has helped to pass have supported victims of gun violence, EMT workers, children in foster care, the deaf and hard of hearing community, retired teachers, among others. Please help me welcome Senator Razor. Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Greg Razor, and we just heard that I'm the senator from the 7th District. Let me say welcome to the 7th District. You're in my district. It is my honor to get to represent the core of Kansas City in the state legislature, in the Missouri Senate. And it's my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you tonight to the heart of America. Welcome to Kansas City, Missouri. Now, that introduction changed my speech just a little, but there's one part I'm going to keep intact. 
you're not going to offend me, but I want to ask, raise your hand if when you received the email, when this year's conference was announced, where the location would be, and you were thinking maybe this time it's LA or Vegas, maybe we're going to South Beach, and you got that email and you opened it up and it said Kansas City, Missouri. How many of you here were the ones who jumped out of your seat and leapt up in excitement? I like it, I like it. Those of you who leapt up are either from here or you have family here or you have friends here. I know it, I know it. But I wanna make a challenge to you. Find some free time and go out and explore our city. We are a city on the rise. We are a city that is exciting and we're a city that believe in ourselves. And it's the diversity of the city that we love it's the history of the city that we love, and it's where we can go tomorrow that we love. It is being seen, hopefully, by you. The National Football League brought their NFL draft here last year, the second largest event that they put on. And by the way, our Chiefs will be playing in the number one event that they put on. So you're going to see a lot of red. And in 2026, out of all the cities in North America, we will be one of only 16 to welcome the world when the World Cup comes to North America. I can go on and on about why I think you're gonna love Kansas City and all of you can sit out there and enjoy my little speech or maybe you roll your eyes and think, well, any elected official at any city we go to is gonna say these things. Why is this any different? It's different because I'm not a native Kansas Cityan. I grew up, it's about a seven hour drive from here on in the extreme southeast Missouri, in the poorest county in our state, on a cotton farm outside of a town of 400. I was taken to our evangelical church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. It was a place where for the first 18 years of my life, I don't think a day went by where I didn't hear something negative said about women or about any number of minority groups. And it was around six years old that I began to realize something was different about me. And I took offense every time any minority group was attacked. Because just like me, there's nothing there you can change. It's who you are, and it's, you should be celebrated for it. That diversity makes us powerful. But it took me a long time to truly understand that. By the time I was a senior in high school and 17 years old, in a little town called Cooter, Missouri, and you can laugh, by the time I was about ready to graduate from high school, I had fallen into a deep depression. And like so many LGBT young people, I was suicidal. And on two separate evenings, came very close to taking my own life. Thankfully, I survived. I made my way to the University of Missouri in Columbia, just two hours down the road. And yeah, go Tigers. <laughs> and there I found a place that allowed me to discover who I am. If my hometown, and don't misunderstand me, there's plenty there that I hold dear, but it sort of taught me who I wasn't, who I didn't want to be as, as an adult. The University of Missouri allowed me the space to understand who I wanted to be. And after college, I moved here. In 2001, this was not a city with a bustling downtown. In fact, I think there were three places after five o'clock you could find something to eat, and that's not a joke. I came here because of the people. The people in Kansas City are amazing. And I feel as if I and the city have grown up together in the last 20 or so years. This downtown is now bustling. And somehow they've taken this kid who was suicidal from Cooter, Missouri, who has a funny accent, who doesn't sound like anybody else around here. And they didn't allow me to become a welcomed outsider they allowed me to become a Kansas Cityan. They allowed that to be first by electing me to the state house, and now the kid from Cooter is the senator from Kansas City. And as an aside, it was just mentioned that we, had, we have had two openly LGBT members of the state senate. I'm proud to say that they have both come from the seventh district right here in Kansas City. So for my LGBT friends, you are welcomed here. We want you here. And for all of you, 
I want to make sure that you know that this is your home too. If only for the weekend, you're at home. If you need something, stop someone on the street. We want you here. We want to welcome you here. And when you go home, we want you to write about how great we are. You hear me? <laughs> That's very important. But let me address one thing seriously for just a moment since the trans legislation was brought up. What we're seeing in the state legislature that I serve in is not the Missouri that I know. The Missouri that I know is very purple and our legislature is very red. Of the six million people in this state, only 34 of us serve in the Senate. There are 24 Republicans and 10 Democrats. I am in the super minority. This bill came up last year and thanks to the rules that we have, I was able to walk on the floor, be recognized, and I led a three-day filibuster. I made it clear to those proposing this health care ban on trans youth and to let you know it was a complete ban on minors that it was not going through before they dealt with me. And so after three days, we had negotiated as best as we could and I didn't win, but we got them to agree that any kid on treatment now, in care now, gets to continue that care. And I got them to agree to put a four-year sunset on the legislation. So in three and a half years, it simply goes away. That was a miracle. So even as a minority member, we can make a difference. We can make a difference. Even as a writer, if you're writing for a small paper, you're writing something that you think might be small, you are making a difference. We can all make a difference in the world. That's why we're here. Make a difference for good. Make a difference to make things better, to make things grow and flourish. Make it look like Kansas City. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for choosing Kansas City, Missouri, and please have a great weekend. Thank you. Senator Razor. Now before we start, I do need to do the housekeeping. As a reminder, AWP strongly encourages attendees who can wear a mask safely to do so at all times while on site in Kansas City. We encourage this practice even for those who are not particularly worried or vulnerable in service to those who are. Please silence your cell phones. Remember, there is no flash photography allowed during this presentation. Respect seats marked as reserved for attendees with accessibility needs. Please give our keynote speaker 10 minutes after the event to get to the book signing table uh, before approaching to have the book signed. <laughs> Lastly, we ask that you please be aware of your fellow attendees who may have disabilities and need help uh, to be more accessible. Specifically, if you see a barrier to accessibility, let us know by calling or texting our accessibility hotline at 240-269-6635. Please also be aware of those with invisible disabilities and do not question someone's use of an accommodation. Now, it is my great pleasure an honor to introduce the 2024 keynote speaker, Jericho Brown. <laughs> Jericho Brown is the author of three collections of poetry, The Tradition, a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award and winner of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. The New Testament, which won the Ansfield Wolf Book Award and was named one of the best of the year by Library Journal, Cold Front, and the Academy of American Poets. And his book, Please, which won the 2009 American Book Award. 
He is also the editor of the anthology, How We Do It, Black Writers on Craft, Practice, and Skill. Brown is the recipient of the Whiting Writers Award and fellowships from the Academy of American Poets, John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University, and Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Krakow Poetry Seminar in Poland. He was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, the Tom Gunn Award, and the Hurston Wright Poetry Prize. He was recently elected an Academy Chancellor in 2024. His poems have appeared in The Nation, The New Yorker, <laughs> uh, The New Republic, and Best American Poetry. Please welcome Jericho Brown. Oh my God. Hi, can everybody hear me? So I'm from a very particular tradition, and in that tradition, if I say something that rings true, you might say something like, mmm. <laughs> and if you really like it, you might even say, amen. <laughs> and I know everybody in this room is not from that tradition, but I know there are enough of you in this room from that tradition that the people who are not will catch on. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to be in Kansas City. I love Kansas City. One of the best times I've had in my literary life was working with the Midwest Poets Series uh, and Bob Stewart, as well as a radio interview I did with Angela Elam for that giant of a lit magazine, New Letters. I love the people of, of Kansas City. Is Senator Razor still here? Did he leave? Oh, thank you, Lord. Uh, I, <laughs> I love the people of Kansas City. Senator Razor wouldn't like this, but I do hope your football team with that unnecessary team name loses the Super Bowl. <laughs> but don't get mad at me about that. Don't get mad at me about that because I also hope the San Francisco 49ers who caused all that trouble for Colin Kaepernick just because he exhibited black dignity and had the nerve to kneel during the national anthem. Yes, I hope the 49ers lose the Super Bowl too. Uh, I should say to Elise, Elise is a poet, so y'all know I got to recognize the poet that graced the stage. Thank you so much for that reading. And thank you so much for that land acknowledgement. It is so important. You know, um, when, when I first started attending events and I would hear land acknowledgements, I would sort of roll my eyes because in order to get to the event, I would have passed so much land that could have been given back. And uh, so what I want to say to you is thank you. I know that in 1824, 200 years ago, no one imagined that we would be doing land acknowledgments. And I also know that there are nations all over this world that do not imagine that they will be doing land acknowledgments. And I pray God in the name of Jesus. <laughs> That, that they do not end up with reason to do more land acknowledgement than they already have to do. Um, it is a particular pleasure to be with the good people who staff, organize, and facilitate all things AWP. Again, they've done their best to put such a lovely conference together for us. I think we should give them a hand. No matter what happens, no matter what gets said, AWP is still the place where a very young Jericho Brown first began saying out of his mouth that he is a poet. People do ask, people do ask, what is it that you write? And because I was answering that question here in my early 20s, I was also in a position where I had to understand I was not the only poet. 
I am not the only writer. And once you know you're a part of a we, you ought to wonder who we are. AWP is also where I successfully learned to haggle over books on Saturday at the book fair. <laughs> I figured out pretty quickly that publishers appreciate less of a load to pack and take back to to take back home, and I am right now apologizing to every publisher I ever terrorized with this knowledge. <laughs> People think it's the Pulitzer, but I believe one of my greatest achievements on earth is going back and forth with Ed Ochester, the former editor of the Pitt Poetry Series, who after telling me that I was killing him, finally relented to selling me four Reginald Shepard poetry books for only 20 bucks. <laughs> then I had the nerve to be confused as to why Pitt kept rejecting my book manuscripts. I'm so sorry, Ed. I was a graduate student then. I was broke, and all I had to leverage at that point in my life was a very slick mouth. I hope Ed Ochester will be willing to forgive me, especially since this April. Pitt will be publishing the vo a volume of selected poems I edited by the late Reginald Shepard. Thank you, Ed Ochester, for seeing me and seeing the future in me. Since y'all clapping, you are welcome to pre-order your copy of The Selected Shepherd right now on whatever app is easiest for you to get to. You are welcome to make that purchase while I am talking. I promise not to say anything too heavy while you're buying that book. Before I get all the way started, I must say I appreciate that introduction from my friend, January O'Neill. She and I have loved one another for a long time, long enough to have friends in common who are no longer here physically. With that in mind, with that in mind, I want to dedicate this keynote to the love life and poetry that manifested themselves to us as Phoebus Etienne and Camila Aisha Moon. I'm glad January told you I was a poet. It's really nice to have someone else introduce me that way. When I have to say it myself, when I meet new people and they ask me what I do, I answer, I'm a poet and they look at me very strangely. <laughs> On a few occasions, people ask me what I do and I tell them I'm a poet, and they will look me directly in my face and say, no, seriously, what do you do? <laughs> or, oh, Jericho, stop playing, what do you do? Or, oh, well, that's nice, a poet, but what do you do for a living? When I repeat that I am a poet, they look at me with the saddest faces <laughs> as if they feel sorry for me. People go as far as telling me other things I can do. <laughs> Some of those people have been my parents. <laughs> One woman on a plane once told me it's never too late for your big break. I, I love telling people who want to talk to me on planes that I'm a poet because it usually keeps them from trying to talk to me. <laughs> I'd rather take a nap than explain what makes my heart beat. Often on planes, when I'm asked what I do, I'll say I'm a poet and my neighboring passenger will huff a bit and respond, I hate poetry. Over the years, I've learned to ask back, you don't have any poem that you love? 
And without hesitation, the same person who just told me they hate poetry recites from memory the entirety of a poem by Emily Dickinson or Robert Frost or Langston Hughes or E.E. E. Cummings. Once in rough air, a 63-year-old black woman from Tennessee gave me the first stanza of Eliot's Wasteland. On another occasion, a 34-year-old white man from New Mexico recited all of Sylvia Plath's daddy as we braced for takeoff. <laughs> it happened. I submit to you book lovers all around that none of these people hated poetry. As a matter of fact, they loved at least one poem enough for it to sustain them for most of their lives. The only thought, they only thought they hated poetry because of the small amount of poetry with which they had made contact. No one really says they hate music. And that's not because everyone can sing. Everyone can't sing, but everyone I know listens to music all the time. While we're in the shower, while we're driving our cars, while we're doing CrossFit and Zumba, we are learning new songs and singing along to old ones and figuring out what we like when we hear music. The actual amount of music you love is less than a fraction of a fraction of all the music there is. Art asks for our presence. You love it but you don't know how much you love it until you are willing to surround yourself with it. You think you hate dance, then you see Desmond Richardson. You think you hate theater, then you see Lynn Nottage. You think you hate poetry, then you meet Jericho Brown on a plane. <laughs> And this is why I'm so happy to be here today. As you can see, most days are very difficult for us poets because our very being seems to cause confusion. Our presence can make people uncomfortable. And though it's doubtful in a room such as this one, just in case anyone is uncomfortable, I should probably explain to you why I am a poet. I am a poet because I love poems deeply, and no matter how deeply I love them, I am dissatisfied by them. I am a poet because I read books by Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks, Adrian Rich, and Lucille Clifton, and I come away from them in tears, wrecked by the beauty of their writing. Yet, I am not so wrecked that I don't notice in even these giants something missing. I'm a poet because I keep trying to write what's missing. I want to write the poems I've always wanted to read. I want to write the poems that only I can write and I want you to read them and be worn out by them. Still, it does feel that we have to do more defending of our vocations, of our lives, than what anyone ought to have to do. When I started dating again, I had to learn to defend my right to read books. I'd get a text from a man at 7.15 that said, Sup. <laughs> and I would respond, reading a book, then that same man would text me at 8.30 p.m. asking, what you doing? <laughs> to which I would reply, reading a book. <laughs> really fine men would eventually stop texting me, <laughs> saying, ain't nobody doing that much reading. They couldn't believe that I could maintain that kind of focus and have a good time doing it. Of course, this was before I understood in queer text language, sup and what you doing actually translate, can you please put that damn book down and come make love to me? <laughs> now that I know that I get a lot less reading done,
That's my favorite joke because now I know I'll have some text messages. More seriously though, part of why we enjoy so many reunions here, part of why students find themselves over overwhelmed in the best way by the conversations had here is because AWP becomes one of the few places on earth that we don't have to worry about explaining ourselves or justifying our love of writing or defending the power writing can indeed wield. I mean, if I'm justifying myself in my love life and on airplanes, what does it look like when I actually put on something other than sweatpants and go outside? Well, earlier this year, for example, the Florida Freedom to Read Project, which shouldn't have to exist, acquired a long list of books that had been recently banned in Escambia County. Among the 1,600 books that had been pulled from shelves in that county in Florida, one of the banned books is The Dictionary. Even Octavia Butler couldn't make this shit up. But I see some of you don't believe me, so here's a quote on the matter from an article by Kelly Jensen in Book Riot. Quote, among the titles pulled from Escambia under the law include five different dictionaries, Webster's Dictionary and Thesaurus for Students, the American Heritage Children's Dictionary, the Dictionary of Costume, the Clear and Simple Thesaurus Dictionary, and Merriam Webster's Elementary Dictionary. There are five annual editions of the Guinness Book of World Records included, eight different encyclopedias, three editions of Ripley's Believe It or Not, as well as books like 100 Bible Stories <laughs> and biographies of people ranging from Beyonce to Lady Gaga and Thurgood Marshall to Oprah Winfrey. Students in Escambia County cannot access books like The Teen Vogue Handbook, An Insider's Guide to Careers in Fashion at their school. Not, nor can they borrow books about Greek and Roman myths from the library. Can you imagine being a poet and you can't get to Greek and Roman myths? Books meant to help understanding sexual assault, teen pregnancy, and sexually transmitted infections are off the shelf, as are Wuthering Heights, a tale of two cities, the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, end quote. That doesn't break your heart? I did my own research into this apocalyptic madness and found that these bands include an encyclopedia of world geography and this one personally upsets me most, a book with which I've identified and from which I found inspiration for most of my life, The Diary of Anne Frank. Now I have to pause here and say that if you are a fascist who we are for some reason still calling a conservative in this country, I totally, <laughs> if you are a fascist, I totally understand why you wanna get rid of some of these books. The Guinness Book of World Records, for instance, does often read like a book of international black history. I've been black long enough to know that people hate me for it. I also see why fascists would want to get rid of books about world geography. I mean, if you are interested in the full-on decimation of Gaza, then you probably want a world where there's little to no record of it or its history or its people having ever existed. I 
I don't want to get us stuck in questions like, why would anyone want to ban the dictionary when we know good and well it's illegal to say the word gay at a school in Florida and illegal in Florida to teach the history of slavery in the United States without also including some lesson about the benefits of slavery. And if anyone here thinks there were benefits to slavery, you're not going to like the rest of my speech. I can only think that if book bans and other current movements in this nation are examples of the radical right, then I have every reason to fear this nation's so-called moderates. And that fear gets shored up, not just by recent horrors like widespread book bans. That fear is enlarged when I see how much of my own understanding, my own civic understanding of life, I've taken for granted. Some of what I'm saying here hinges on a recent horrible experience that helped me rethink my own priorities as a writer, an experience that isn't ne necessarily writerly per se, but causes me a bit of shame and a lot of sadness. This past fall, my white next door neighbors called the cops on the black people who maintain the lawn while I'm away. And it was completely lawful. It is against the law to have a contractor work on your yard on Sundays where I live. Because I live in a church. When I asked why they did this without informing me before or after, they said it was because the law obligated them to do it and because they didn't have my number. They also said it shouldn't be a big deal because, quote, normal people don't work on Sundays. They also told me they wouldn't have called the cops on me if I were doing the yard myself on a Sunday because that's not what's illegal. So noise was not the problem here, folks. When I told them I found, I found all of this quite unneighborly and even dangerous, they left a copy of City Code in my mailbox to, quote, clear up our misunderstanding and to show they had been right. These are people that until this point, my grandmother would have called good white people. I realize now I was particularly hurt by all of this for three reasons. The first is that landscaping is the work I grew up doing with and for my, my dad. My father characterized himself as a businessman and the people who worked for him those long hot days in Louisiana were me, my mother, and my sister. I remember us having been harassed while we were in the middle of trying to make a living through hard work. The second reason is that my sudden ability to be able to own a home and pay someone else to mow the lawn is not an ability that could save the people who do that work if a situation with the police officer were to escalate. And finally, my neighbors calling the police on black people for working in 2023 felt in that moment what so much of everything we see keeps feeling like, like the work of writing and reading and educating and even just sharing experiences on social media the last 15 years or so was quite the waste. Certainly, my neighbors had a television in the summer of 2020 what is it that they didn't see? Today, I think much of 2023 was about showing me how much I didn't know people and how much they don't know me, how much none of us seem to know one another in so many deep and important ways. After the horrors of October 7th and the really wild retribution that has followed, I learned things about my writer friends that I had not fathomed because they are writers. And they learned things about me that they had not fathomed because they were so busy seeing me as a writer that somehow they forgot I'm black. 
I got black concerns and black politics. And because of that, my analogies include thinking about what anything that looks like occupation or colonialism must have looked like historically for black people all over the planet. Analogies be damned. Human beings can't help but make them, can't help but understand the world through them. The failure of my friends and I, the failure of my neighbors, is the exact thing that every writer in this room agrees is a bad idea. No matter your aesthetic proclivities, none of us wants to see a hollow, flat character. None of us is interested in reading the stereotype. When we read, when we write, when we want to, when we read, when we write, we want to make the human as evident and deep and beautiful and human as human complexity can be. And the characters, the speakers in our poems that come to us as most contradictory within themselves while also remaining whole are the characters we remember. They are the characters for whom we admire the, the writers we admire most. You can't read a character like that without having that character you can't read a character like that without loving that character, even when that character does something that is dead wrong. That's why I love Miranda Priestley. Miranda Priestley from The Devil Wears Prada was an awful person to work with, but she was willing to get on a plane in a hurricane if that's what it took not to miss her daughter's recital. And I remember the novelist Tiari Jones saying she had trouble finishing her most recent book, An American Marriage, because she had yet given up her grudges and allowed herself to fall in love with all of her characters. When humans aware of their intricate selves encounter other humans who we imagine have intricate selves, we can't help but fall in love. And even if we don't make it as far as love, we are convicted by compassion. I know I may have entered terrain here that some of you think has nothing to do with writing. But I've come to this point because of the people at this conference, more than any other people I know, are almost always talking to me or in front of me about saving democracy from the perils of impending fascism. I understand when someone starts talking this way in the United States of America, the response is often to at best say, it couldn't be that big a deal. And at worst, say the person talking is a conspiracy theorist. But if, we're, but if we're people who believe in words, we have to stop saying what we keep saying about democracy, about capitalism, about fascism, if we're not going to live like what we're saying is true. And it is true that every day we see so much of so-called democracy and its freedoms dismantled that many of us wonder if it isn't already too late or already over. In Georgia, for instance, the state where I live, tenure itself is not really a part of the promotion process for professors at public institutions of higher learning. In March of 22, Rachel Garbus wrote an article for Atlanta Magazine in which she properly reported the American Association of University Professors voted to censor, quote, the entire university system of Georgia for effectively abolishing tenure in flagrant violation of long-standing principles on academic freedom, end quote. To be more clear, if you teach writing workshops as a professor at UGA or Georgia State, it is riskier than it was before to have people out here calling you a writer activist. Some of us think our biggest enemies are the formalists. Some of us think 
our biggest enemies are people who teach limited omniscient as a point of view in fiction. Some of us think our biggest enemies are people who call their writing autofiction. We want to know what was wrong with the term autobiographical novel. A good poet friend of mine with whom I love to argue once told me her biggest enemies were people who thought they could cover up the fact of their bad writing by putting pictures in a book and calling it experimental. But I stopped by this podium tonight to tell you that if you are under the impression that another writer is your problem, you haven't yet fathomed the problems fascism makes for folks who call themselves writers. Once you know you're a part of a we, you ought to wonder who we are. If the fight is really against fascism, then who are we if we lose that fight? A better question. If the fight is really against fascism, who do we need to be if we lose that fight? What do you think happens to writers, to intellectuals, to artists, and to academics in the fascist state? What do you think happens to black queer people from the South who can't shut up on Twitter in the fascist state? What do you think happens to people with disabilities in the fascist state? People with disabilities who keep telling AWP, I'm going to come back, but y'all ain't got it right yet. When we think of the writers we love, and admire, when we think of those writers who actually lived and died through and because of oppressious, oppressive regimes, how much are we actually like them? How much are we prepared to protect those who are like them? How much have we prepared for a world where our sense of community, our ability to be there for one another, is a real matter of life and death? I was talking about this with a friend who told me I couldn't use her name, but she's a black lesbian poet and professor of women and gender studies. When I mentioned, when I mentioned, when I mentioned what life might be like had the January 6th insurrectionists murdered everyone they certainly would have murdered, she started talking about how we'd have to be ready to march to the death camps. But I told her she had me mixed up because I was getting two bumper stickers, one that says blue lives matter and one that says all lives matter. I told her I like my house too much to be moved to a quarter for gender traitors or a death camp. So she'd have to marry me and I'd have to keep her pregnant. I'd start going to the most fundamentalist church I can find and give frequent testimonies about having been cleansed of the evil spirit of homosexuality. And we just have to rat on the hidden location of all the poets we never liked anyway. And she laughed and said, Jericho, what would we write? What would we teach? And I said, we just have to give that up. And she said, you don't see how that in itself is a death camp? Now, my friend and comrade Carolyn Forche will get upset with me for what I'm about to say next. And to calm her fears in advance, I want you to check out all the work she and Rachel DeWaskin and so many other amazing thought leaders are doing at writersfordemocraticaction.org. But this is not a keynote asking you to vote for Joe Biden. You are, you are quite welcome to do that. 
but I am speaking to a perennial problem that exists among us no matter who is president of the United States or governor of Florida or of Georgia. I am asking whether or not you are right now ready to treat one another as we would have to if we weren't so convinced that we don't already live in a fascist state. Once you know you're a part of a we, you ought to wonder who we are. In spite of the trappings of democracy, can you look at me and see a man you are willing to hide in your attic? The answer to that question is who we actually are, no matter who the president is. And if you are ashamed of your answer, you have some time to become the person who would give a different answer. Yes, this is an election year. By Halloween this year, we will have seen more monsters, ghouls, and goblins than Jordan Peele can handle. It is important that the people in this room and at this conference remember no matter how monstrous things seem, whatever evils are committed, they will not be committed by goblins and ghouls. They will be committed by people. It is important that the people in this room encounter people with the understanding of human possibility to harm one another. And that's important because it tells us who we have to protect. We owe one another the right to our writing lives. We owe one another at a time as fraught as this real dedication to one another's ability to get good work done without suppression, without imprisonment, without death. And that debt has to move beyond this room, beyond this conference. We got to care about writers who are not necessarily American writers. We have to be concerned that when it's time to murder people, they murder the writers in Palestine, in Sudan. We can't think we're making round characters if we have yet to take a second and see one another roundly. I'll say it this way. There really are people who get up early in the morning and go to work with the idea that humane treatment for us and the people we love could make for serious tears in the fabric of our nation. They censor and ban us because they perceive us as powerful and are worried that we will do something that could turn things upside down and make their hatred clear for what it is. And I'm so glad they are right. I'm so glad they are right about me, and I hope my poems continue to make them writer. I am here to do what good writing has done to me. There is nothing to justify. There is nothing to defend. I mean to make what will stymie your mind and change your life. We know what writing does for us. We've seen what it can do for our students. We know, what la we know that language has power, and that is the power the people at this conference mean to wield. We say they to a single person, understanding the same language that frees some of us, oppresses others of us. We say enslaved rather than slaves, understanding that the same language that frees some of us oppresses others of us. We know you can't call something a war if you have the power to turn off your opponent's water. And if you don't, and if you don't have the power we have in this room, we only feel sorry for you but we don't feel shame. If we are guilty, we are guilty of continuing to do our thing, participating in a world where those who want us underpaid, disenfranchised, or dead would rather we not participate. 
We must champion the writing we love most, yes. And we must continue to fight for the right of every writer to write whatever it is they must. I want to close with a writing assignment. I'm a teacher, and I can't help but think of writing exercises every time somebody gives me a microphone. You can get your pen and paper out, or you could just put it in the notes of your smartphone. I know your smartphone is out because you bought that book I told you to buy earlier. <laughs> and this exercise is meant to stimulate and bring you closer to your own amazing imagination. The first step is to remember the fact that everyone in this room has the same assignment. As you work on yours, someone else is grappling with the same writing problem with which you are grappling. The second step is to remember that this room really is inhabited by some of the most imaginative and talented people on the planet. You are not alone. You have all over this nation people as smart as you, people who love language as much as you do, working on the same assignment. Step three is to imagine a world where almost everyone agrees that the most important thing above all else is that no one dies of anything other than old age. Imagine a world where food and education and international relations are such that people live in or are working toward a situation where death is a matter of time and not a matter of one person wanting another dead, and not a matter of anyone ranking lives such that the longevity of one is more important than the longevity of another. If a black trans woman dies in America, it is only because she's gotten old. If a Palestinian baby dies in Gaza, it is only because she's no longer a baby. She just got old. Everybody in the Democratic Republic of Congo, old and also rich. <laughs> Everybody in the region of Darfur and the city of Khartoum, old and also loud. In the fourth step, I want you to write the poem the scene, the article, the essay, the novel, the memoir, or the screenplay that refers to what that new world or that refers to that new world or that shows how that world came to be or that shows who it is that can't stand that new world. In the fifth step, and this is the final step. I want you to be postmodern enough in your writing to deal with all the reasons why you might not even allow your imagination to see that world in your dreams. That will tell you what you have against that world in real life. I've taken a lot of classes, and now that I teach, I do what I would want done in that class if I were a student. I design my syllabus around what I would need if I were my own student. Life's question is whether you can write a play such that it is the play you've always wanted to see. Can you write the songs you've always wanted to hear? As young as I am, my grandparents on both sides of my family were sharecroppers. My mother's grandparents had been enslaved people freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. My mother grew up in a family where if you were old enough to walk, you were old enough to pick cotton. 
And before she was nine years old, she had made a bit of a name for herself as the girl who could pick cotton faster than many of the grown men and women she worked alongside. So of course, I remain grateful for and in awe of my own life, of our lives together. And not just because I never picked cotton. My gratitude is made full by what my ancestors dreamed for us and by the parts of our lives we live that they may not have imagined. Our job is to imagine what our forebears did not even have the means to dream. I am grateful for my imagination, for our ability to meet needs people didn't even know they had before they read our poems or saw our films or heard our songs. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great conference. Good night. Thanks again to Jericho Brown. What a wonderful, wonderful keynote. So Jericho will be signing books, but we need to get him to the table. So give us a few minutes and then we'll set up. Thank you, everybody. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.